Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by... For over 30 years, Vanguard Outdoors has made the gear that turns a regular hunt into another fine day of field. We know that a good shooting stick or a nice pair of binoculars can make or break your day. Our design teams include serious hunters who work hard to bring you the best sporting optics, shooting sticks, tripods, bags, and more. We are Vanguard Outdoors. Hi everybody, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny Silik and we have a brand new show put together for you this week. You won't want to miss it. We've been promising you some goose hunting action and we're going to deliver on this week's show. Jordan will take us on a couple of different hunts in different parts of the Lower Peninsula. We'll be down in the southern area and in the central area of the Lower Peninsula. And speaking of goose hunting, Jimmy's got another story in store for us this week. Well, that's right, Jenny. When it comes to goose hunting, duck hunting, or really just any kind of shotgunning in general, one of the things that has changed quite a bit over the years is the ammunition that we use. We're going to highlight a Michigan company on this week's show that is really at the cutting edge of some of the things that have changed quite a bit over the years. A lot of good stories on this week's show. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger, and it's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, dancing on the pine forest floor. The autumn colors catch your eyes, here come the crystal winter skies. It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors. What a beautiful day in the woods. Someday our children all will see this is their finest legacy. The wonder and the love of Michigan as the wind comes whispering through the trees. The sweet smell of nature's in the air. Great Lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's meat processor and Michigan destination since 1988. Offers a variety of homemade smoked meats and Michigan-made products in-store and online. The Country Smokehouse features an outdoor barbecue and bar. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. By G5 Outdoors. Makers of the Quest and Prime bows, manufactured and designed in Memphis, Michigan. G5 offers a line of archery bows, broadheads, and accessories on the web at g5outdoors.com. By Green Mark Equipment. Green Mark Equipment is a John Deere dealership network in southwest Michigan and northern Indiana. Green Mark provides sales and services to farmers, commercial businesses, large property owners, and homeowners. Information about pricing and products available can be found online at greenmarkequipment.com. This moment brought to you by DTE's Clean Vision. We kick off this week's show in the goose fields of southern Michigan, where I was able to tag along with a group of hunters hoping to take advantage of a promising setup and enjoy a beautiful sunrise along the way. We're out here in Ingham County, uh, just outside of Stockbridge. Been seeing probably 100, 150 birds in this field, um, pretty much consistently. Um, quite a bit of birds flying over. There's a whole bunch of birds in the area. Last few days we've seen probably 400 in the area. Like I said, probably 150 in the field. Um, Hoping they'll get to going, get flying as soon as the uh, fog lifts up and uh, we can make something happen. We got a bunch of different, a uh, little bit bigger family groups. Um, it seems like lately this early season the, uh, the geese have been sticking to a little bit bigger family groups than normal. Um, I got just over a dozen, dozen and a half in, in most of our family groups. Um, like I said, we've been seeing probably 100, 150 birds in the field. Um, I don't want to run such a big spread that when they see it they're almost overwhelmed in early season rather kind of run my spread just a little bit smaller. Um, just something a little different, you're not throwing everything at them. A, a better looking group than, well maybe not better looking necessarily, but uh, just a, a different look.
The first three birds did land in our spread, but the big group that was behind them landed at the other end of the field, not too far from where we parked, which ended up being a problem for the rest of the morning. <laughs> They're all landing over there on the, the property where everybody parked. Why wouldn't they? Uh, birds last night have been coming in from the east. Um, just not want to commit. Either short stopping or just circling and kind of slowly flaring off. We got a big group on the field on the other side of the property from us. Uh, probably. 50 to 100 birds in that, so we're kind of competing with them right now. Hopefully some more start flying here now. It's starting to kind of warm up a little bit. It gets a few more up late, birds up late. Uh, we're going to move the decoys a little bit and see if we can't get them to commit into the spread a little bit. All of our birds went uh, to the opposite field. We got a couple small flocks that finally flew through, decided they didn't want to exactly land in the spread, but uh, we did what we could. We managed to drop two. Ty's got one, Joe's got another, and uh, hopefully, yeah, we got more flying. Hopefully we can put some more down. Well, those two geese would be our only two of the morning. Early season goose hunting can be a little tricky but it sure felt good to be back out in the field. Special thanks to Colt and the crew for letting me tag along on a beautiful morning of goose hunting here in Southern Michigan. A little later on in September, I was able to get back out in the field for another goose hunt, this time with a different group of hunters in the central part of the state. It was a beautiful and foggy morning and hopes were high as we set things up. Here we are on a goose hunt in central Michigan. Jordan just hopped out with us this morning. We got everything set up. Decoys, blinds, uh, birds have been here the last couple days, nice and comfortable in this wheat field. Uh, it's real foggy this morning, low wind, so we'll see what time they fly and if they want to play nice, participate. Uh, numbers were pretty strong in the beginning and usually that you know second to third week, you're kind of in between the residents and the molts showing up. Uh, we had a, a good push of molts about a week ago. We definitely could use another push and could definitely use some crops coming down. Today we're hunting over about four to five dozen Dave Smith decoys, they're all full bodies, about the nicest decoys you can get without getting the stuffers. But uh, having no wind, we kept everything nice and tight so we can pretty much shoot the whole spread. It's a nice realistic set. A lot of these geese have been here you know, for the whole season, uh, so they've been getting shot at by other groups of guys. So you have to look nice and real and give them a good presentation so that uh, you hopefully can fool them. <laughs> The morning couldn't have started out a whole lot better, with the first flock of geese doing exactly as we had hoped. As the sun slowly started to rise, we all enjoyed the sights and sounds of goose hunting, as well as some quality dog work along the way. Shoot him guys, right up top, lead him! Here. 
Doug's a young pup from Southern Oak Kennels North out of Athens, Michigan. Uh, he's a British import. He's actually born overseas and, and brought over. Um, didn't quite make the cut for their breeding uh, requirements, but uh, he definitely is a darn good dog in the field. So uh, we've been able to put him to work, and uh, he's still just getting back in the swing of things. By the end of season, again, he'll be uh, a seasoned beast. Uh, but uh, he's been shopping around, picking up a bird, dropping it, whatever. But uh, that's just nitpicky stuff. It's always good to watch the dogs work. So he loves. It. I think he loves his job more than we love to hunt, honestly. So you can see how excited he is, and uh, definitely uh, enjoy the footage of that. Hey, right over top again, guys. Get so we're probably part way through the morning. We've had a uh, good bit of action already. The bigger flocks haven't really wanted to participate, so that's kind of a bummer. We had a couple good spins, uh, 15 to 30, decoy pretty well. To be expected though, finishing from one side, finishing from the other side, finishing from out front, over the back, no wind, you gotta take what you can get. So we've had some flybys that it's like, eh, should you shoot, should you not? Definitely that last pair probably should have called it, but uh, they live to see another day. So I'm sure there's still a few more birds with it being foggy like this that are gonna bop around a little bit throughout the morning. So we'll see if uh, we can't keep picking away at them. Waterfowl hunting can be as easy or as complex as you want to make it. Uh, at this point, we've obviously made it pretty complex. We've got some of the nicest decoys and equipment you can get, um, competition grade calling. Um, Paul's won tons of competitions, but at the end of the day, practicing, you know, sounding like a goose is important, but reading what to give the geese while they're working you is, is even more important. Um, so focusing on how the geese react to your calling is going to be number one. Uh, are they are they responding well and, and coming towards you? Are they starting to pull off? Is it a calm day? Like today, it's very calm. Once they get inside that hundred yard mark, you know you might pull their attention and hit them real hard at a distance. But once they start coming in to inside of a hundred yards, you're gonna blow blow them right out if you call too much. So we really try and slow it down a little bit and and just sound like real geese on the ground, honks, clucks, moans, um, and, and really help to finish those geese where you want them. And if if they're finishing where you want them. Just let them do their thing. Sometimes no calling at all does a really good job. So you want to ultimately look like live geese on the ground. So the calling paired with a, a lifelike spread. We had the spread kind of a little bit tighter this morning, uh, but as it's gone on and they, like I said, finished from different directions, we kind of shifted a few things. Um, so it's a little bit choppier right now to kind of get them to focus on the middle of the hole. Um, some days they're going to land in the open space, some days they're going to land in the decoys. It really depends how aggressive they're feeding. Um, these geese are very comfortable in this field. They probably know, hey, you know, there's plenty of food to go around. We don't need to be that aggressive. But other places, big, bigger flocks of birds are going to be real aggressive and land in the decoys or ahead of the decoys to get ahead of that feed line of birds. We were having a great morning with plenty of birds to show for it, but as Connor explained, there's a lot more to waterfowl hunting than just how many birds end up on the ground. Ultimately, you know, guiding and outfitting, uh, killing birds is what's paying the bills. It's it's kind of what your reputation becomes, and, and you do want to be known for being productive in that regard but at the end of the day it's not about killing it really is about the entire overall experience so once you start shifting from focusing on killing 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 and then remembering hey this is why we actually do it bringing everybody together uh, around the camaraderie of waterfowling getting youth introduced to the sport or new new hunters introduced to the sport that's what it's really all about so don't ever get too washed up and, and focusing on just killing in piles and social media that you get so distracted uh, by what waterfowl re really really is at its roots so I really enjoy being able to share it with guys that have waterfowl hunted for much longer than I've been alive uh, in days before spending time in the field with a cell phone was a thing and hearing those stories and, and how things have changed but at the end of the day you know we do get right down to the roots of nothing really has changed when you focus on that camaraderie aspect of waterfowling. The early goose season has come and gone, but there's still lots of good waterfall opportunities ahead. Good luck to all of the waterfall hunters out there, and special thanks to Connor and the crew for letting me tag along on a fun day of goose hunting here in mid-Michigan.
Well, those two hunts were a lot of fun, and we're going to stay in that waterfall lane to wrap up this week's show. Next up, I was able to spend some time with a Michigan company that specializes in building waterfall ammunition. All right, you're in Stevensville, Michigan at uh, Boss Headquarters. And we got started um, officially in 2018. Origins go back a year prior to that. I grew up um, enamored with duck hunting and goose hunting. I, I would go to the, uh, the early draws in the, you know, the falls up at the Todd Farm. I remember being in kindergarten and first grade and uh, being all part of that, that whole draw outside in the parking lot where guys are pulling the numbers. And, and I just remember that kind of that camaraderie and competition at the same time, you know, when everyone's fighting for that number one draw. Um, one of the things that, that got me thinking about getting into the ammunition business was my son, who I, I saw my son growing up when it was me, you know, 25 years ago. Um, one of the problems I had when he was five or six years old was the lack of non-toxic ammunition that we could go chase ducks and geese with that wouldn't send them in the next week with all the recoil. And since that time, um, we've been able to develop some low recoil, uh, ultra lethal loads in, two, in a two and three quarter 12 gauge, all the way down to 410 and everything in between. So part of that whole concept of what Boss came to be and why it got going was just to come up with something to do with my son and get him involved in the outdoors. After spending some time learning about how the company got started, we headed down the road to the manufacturing facility to learn all about how a shotgun shell is made. At present moment, we are sourcing all of our, our hulls. They come with the primers in them. Those come out of Italy. Um, our gunpowder is manufactured in Florida by St. Mark's. Uh, we buy it through Hodgden, which a lot of the handload guys will be familiar with that, that brand. Um, I grew up reloading shotgun shells using the, the same powders, a lot of the same powders that we use now. And then we're alloying and pouring our own bismuth shot. We alloy bismuth and tin together. Um, it runs through the manufacturing process uh, where we're dripping out anywhere from 100 to 200 pellets per second per machine. Uh, we dry the shot, we polish it, it, goes into our automated plating line where we deposit the layer of copper on it. Then it goes back um, in the manufacturing area where everything comes together. You know, we're, we're making the wads here in-house now. Those get transferred over to the Bridgman manufacturing facility. Like I said, where everything you know marries up with uh, the hulls, get checked for accurate length, primer location. Uh, we're dropping the powder in, it's measuring the powder, dropping the wad, make sure it's in the correct orientation. We're dropping the shot, measuring the amount of shot that gets dropped, closing it up, checking final height. Down it goes, gets printed, boxed up, brought over to this building where it gets distributed out. There's a lot that goes into building a shotgun shell, and even these seemingly simple components, like the wad, are pretty complex. One of the things that we incorporated into our design of the, the Warchief wad was to, first off, be able to have it be mass produced, um, run through our loading presses. So our wad, instead of like typical wads of magnum caliber shells, we stitch the, the pedals so they're designed to open up really quickly on, on once they're out of the barrel. And then we've got the hinges to release the shot column as quickly as possible. And that's one of the features we found actually works better. Um, instead of keeping the shot in the wad for a longer period of time, we try to get it to release as quickly as we can. So we incorporated that with some hinges here, but still kept a full layer of plastic surrounding everything. We created a secondary gas seal here that helps us reduce the amount of powder that we need to put in the shell, which will give better cold weather performance because less powder you have to light, the easier and more cleanly it burns in low temperature. We added a cushion section to help absorb some of that initial impact and shock. It also allows us to compress the wad a little bit for larger shot um, when the shells are being loaded and give us a nice tight crimp upon assembly. And then the piston over here is a relatively thin wall. It's got a constant taper on it that helps it, it seal up as it's running down the, uh, the, the barrel. So one of the benefits of Warchief 
is that we've buffered the shot column with a combination of um, walnut shell, fabric softener, vegetable oil, and graphite. So in my left hand here is what the wad would look like after the shot is released from it under normal conditions without buffer. And this is what we get after we buffer it. It's nice and smooth. There's minimal indentations and the buffering material has done a good job of protecting that shot and not allowing it to deform as it's doing as it mushes in the pellet or the, the pellets mush into the plastic here and also in the walls of the, the uh, wad pedal as it's running down the barrel. You don't see that in the War Chief with the buffer. After learning all about what goes inside the shotgun shell, we decided to go outside and fire a few rounds to see how they pattern. So now that you guys got to see how the shells are assembled, we just went outside real quick and shot a couple patterns with a 28 gauge Benelli and a 12 gauge Benelli M1, old gun. Um, we shot at 30 and 40 yards. We used an improved modified choke from the factory and uh, just did a quick pellet count analysis. Today is a little bit warm, so the numbers are a little bit higher than anticipated. And for this application here at 30 yards, I wouldn't recommend shooting a choke this tight. We're throwing 96% of the pellets inside the pattern, which is a good number. But if you look at the distribution here, there are some big holes like a super dense center core. Um, again, it is warm and it's also a 30 yard shot. I wouldn't recommend shooting a choke as tight as we did. But if you look at what it turns into, if you imagine this would be the same shell that was two, the difference between 30 yards and here at 40, you can see now this is something more typical of a 30 yard pattern um, of a gun of similar size. So here we are at uh, 40 yards with a 3.5 War Chief shell shooting 77%. That's a terrific number. Normally we're trying to get in the high 60s. Um, and again, we're talking 28 gauge, so really small bore. Um, so that's the 28 gauge. Moving on to the, the 12 gauge, this we uh, switched it up, we shot number fours, which is an offset to the three fives in popularity. It's a three inch shell, ounce and a half. 30 yards, we threw 98% inside the 30 inch circle. Um, and I should note, when we're shooting patterns, we are uh, hanging a, a blank piece of cardboard up. We're aiming at a fixed point, usually right in the middle of the cardboard, pulling the trigger, and then we're drawing our 30 inch circle around the densest par part of the pattern. Typically guys are gonna draw a circle, shoot it, and then if they're high or low or left or right, they're gonna say, well, this, this pattern doesn't work. Um, it's not a good representation of what the gun and shell is capable of doing. That's more demonstrative of what the shooter's doing. So shoot, draw, count is what we like to do. So again here, this is really tight. Again, improved modified choke, 30 yards. This is gonna end up probably making a ton of feathers fly in the air if you shoot a duck or a goose with this type of choke um, at this range, 30 yards. Now again, moving out to 40, you're gonna start seeing where things really, really kind of take shape and have a beautiful distribution of pellets at a relatively high uh, pattern rate, 89.3%. Uh, so we're close to 90%. Industry standard is 70. So with the War Chief and the way this shell is constructed with this type of choke, we're improving our, our pattern densities by 20% and also improving ballistic gel penetration and pellet performance because those shells are, or the, the shot inside the shell is staying nice and round. It's always good to see a Michigan company doing well in the outdoor industry. Special thanks to Brandon and the entire crew for showing me around for giving us all a little insight on what goes in to building a quality shotgun shell. Thank you so much for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you stick around in upcoming weeks. We've got all sorts of exciting things planned to share with you here on the show. We'll take you to the Upper Peninsula for a couple of different adventures there. We'll give you a bow hunting update and share with you a Michigan made product. You won't want to miss those stories. If you'd like to see where we are, where we're headed next, or just get in touch with us, you can always do that online. Well, that's right, Jenny. Online is a good way to kind of keep tabs on us. The best way is probably Facebook and Instagram as well as YouTube. You can subscribe there, get an email every time we post something new. Lots of new stuff coming over the next several weeks. Bow hunting, grouse hunting, a little bit of fishing thrown in there. So much stuff going on right now. Get out and enjoy it. And if we don't see you in the woods or on the water, hopefully we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by... Do you dream of somewhere bigger than your backyard? 
you can get there with Greenstone. Whether you want to hunt, fish, hike, or just watch the sunset, we're ready to help you own your place in the great outdoors. To learn more, visit GreenstoneFCS.com. By Alta Equipment Company, providing sales, rentals, service, and parts because uptime matters. From earth moving to landscaping and light construction, Alta offers over 50 brands across seven Michigan locations to serve you. More information online or 844-GO-2-ALTA. By SCI. SCI helps protect, promote, and preserve wildlife through conservation practices, which include hunting. SCI supports and funds conservation programs in the state of Michigan. Learn more how you can get involved at a chapter near you. By Jace Sporting Goods, with locations in Clare and Gaylord. Jace has been serving the Michigan outdoor enthusiasts since 1971 with a wide variety of outdoor products. The gear, the knowledge, the tradition of Jays. On the web at jaysportinggoods.com. When I want a far away, a dream stays with me night and day. It's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow trout in a hidden stream. The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees. I am a Michigan man. I am, I am a Michigan man. That's where I'm from and I'll show you my hands. Lord above, I love this land, I am a Michigan man. From the Keweenaw down to St. Joe, Kalamazoo, East to Monroe, to St. Marie and back again, I am a Michigan man. I am, I am a Michigan man, that's where I'm from, and I'll show you my hands. Lord above, 